Moving on to the next, uh, we have Purinama Nayar um, coming on with us. Uh, there we are. Hi, Purinama, how are you doing? Hi, Jamie, I'm good, thank you. Oh, excellent. Okay, I can hear you perfectly. You look great. So we're just going to go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to be talking about components in Blazor. Um, so take it away. Sure. Hello and welcome. I'm Purnima Nair and uh, I'll be talking about components in Blazor today. I'm a freelance developer based in Langley, Berkshire, UK. I do a lot of work around the Umbraco CMS and I've been an Umbraco MVP for two years in running. Non-work me, I read a lot, mainly fiction, and uh, I learn Carnatic music in my spare time as well. That's my Twitter handle, should you wish to connect with me. Straight into the topic, uh, components are building blocks of Blazor apps. They are files with .razor extension. So if you are an MVC developer, uh, you might be really familiar with the syntax that I'll be demoing today. They are basically using Razor code uh, in your files. Uh, your Blazor app could have pages, it could have forms, it could have shared dialogues. All of them are components at the end of the day. Components can be nested, um, so, that, so you can call one component from another component that can be reused. So if you're really clever with your architecture of the components, you can even have a shared library of sorts which you can share between your various Blazor apps. Component names in Blazor must always start with an uppercase character. Uh, if you want to include a component in another component, you can do so by using the name of the component as the HTML tag. So in my case, I've got an example razor called my component razor, which is a component. And as you can see, the name of the component becomes my HTML tag. Uh, and that, that is how I would call my component in a page or in another component. Uh, components compile into partial classes, usually of the same name as the component itself. It's a really tiny bit of knowledge, but this particular tiny bit of knowledge goes a long way, trust me. Today's demo, I have put together a sample repo. Uh, it's based on the Blazor WebAssembly model. Um, and I will be talking about a series of things or series of features which components portray. Um, and I'll be basically touching the pages folder that you see here, the shared folder and the www root time dependent. Uh, but I believe the link to my demo, uh, demo repo has been already shared with you. The first thing I would like to discuss uh, about components is routing. If you look at any of the uh, Razor components in the pages folder, you can see uh, something with a page directive right at the top of the file. So this suggests to Blazor that this is a page in your web, web application, Blazor application. And when these components compile into partial classes, a route attribute gets attached to those partial classes. And this effectively becomes the route template. So you can spe specify your route template and that's attached to the route attribute of the partial class. When user requests a URL from your app, uh, the router goes in and tries to find a match for the incoming URL against any of the route templates it's got the knowledge about. So in, in this case, if the user um, is requesting parameters, the razor would find this particular component and return this component. And all this routing magic happens in the root component of the app, which is the app.razor. Here you have the router. It tries to find out what's going on does it have a matching route template uh, in its knowledge? If it finds anything, it passes it on to the route view template, and then your component gets rendered to the end user. Any route data is also passed through. If it doesn't find any match, sorry, there's nothing to be displayed. That message gets shown through. Uh, the next thing we can talk about is how to include C-sharp code in your components. Components are quite versatile, so it's just not racist syntax that goes into them. You can add C-sharp code and make it as flexible as you want, make it as interactive as you want. There are two ways of doing it. First one is the code directive way. <clears throat> in the code directive way, your razor code as well as your C-sharp uh, code will coexist in the same file. 
Uh, once you are inside the code directive, anything that you can put in the class can be put in, in the code directive. You can even have multiple code directives, but you can then have fields, you can have methods, um, your lifecycle events, everything goes inside the code directive. Uh, and this is not only for the pages or uh, components with the page directive, you can also have the same thing in a shared uh, shared component as well. So even with shared component, it's the same kind of uh, structure that follows. You can have your razor code and then the code directive. The second way to have this or to have in C sharp code in your components is by splitting it out into two files. One, uh, the first part of the file would have the razor code alone. And as you can see, my, my component is called code partial class. And it's the same exact code that I have got in my code directive demo here except that I've changed the heading here. The C sharp part of this would go into a partial class of the same name as the component here. It is important that it is a public partial class, otherwise it would just not compile and the name needs to match up, obviously in the same namespace as well. And the same exact code that I've got here has been put in here. Uh, my demo is already running. So if I take you through the demo here, this is I've extended the navigation which comes out of the box in the Visual Studio template. Uh, and I've just lined it up so that I can take you through the demo quickly. The code directive demo, it works fine. It updates the counter for me. And if I go to the code partial class demo, it updates it so for, me, for me as well. As you can see, there's absolutely no difference in the way it functions. For me, this is all about how I want to lay out my code. And if you're wondering whether um, in the code directive demo where you had C sharp and the razor file coexisting, whether you can actually see the code going ahead in the view source, you just can't. You won't be able to see that. It's all nicely hidden from you. But of course, it's the WebAssembly model, so you would have all the DLLs uh, downloaded locally for you. Let's talk about parameters and components. Components can, can consume parameters, which is what makes them so versatile because they can accept dynamic data and then perform logic according to them. Uh, the first type of parameters I want to look at is the route parameters. I've got this parameter component here. Let me close the other one. And in my page directive, when I specify the route template, I can have specific values in this format, in this convention. Uh, when I specify a string inside parentheses in a route template, that's treated as a route parameter. Um, you can have multiple route parameters. You can even have parameter well within the URL. There is no hard and fast rule that it should be right at the end of the URL. And this is us providing a route template or passing a value. But how does the component consume it? Uh, it is consumed by using a public property of the same name as the parameter. So I've got value and I've got other value as two parameters that I've supplied to the route template. I specify public properties of the same name. Uh, it's a case insensitive match as you can see, but I've adorned both of them with the parameter attribute. This kind of matches up with a little bit of convention and it tells Blazor that this properties needs to be treated as a route template especially because we have page directives with route templates specified for this particular component. Uh, and if you are to look at my demo here, uh, in my navigation, I've hard coded something. Uh, I've hard coded the URL to be parameter slash, this is a route parameter. Going into the file, I can see that the value property has been, the value parameter has been picked up and it is displaying properly. Uh, if I change this to say, value slash value one slash value two say uh, it's from my browser history um, it is mapped against the parameter slash value slash other value route which i have specified here it's mapping up if i change the value to to say hello it matches it against this particular route and the other value is completely ignored um, at this point of time, I don't think we can have optional parameters in routes. So if you, the workaround for that is to have a route template with no parameters and then specify any parameters that you want. So that's about route parameters. The next type of parameters that components can consume are 
component parameters. And for that, I've got a little shared component here called display text. I again have a public property here called text, which I'm trying to display using at the rate syntax. Um, and I've adorned this public property with the name parameter. In cases like this, where you have a component without a route template specified, if I have a public property with a parameter that is treated as a component parameter. Now, if I want to call this component from another component, I would be using the name of the component as a display text. This is what I explained in my introduction files, slides. Uh, I'm using this as the HTML syntax and the HTML tag is display text going by the razor component name. And as you can see, something called text is available to me. This text is in fact the parameter that I specified here, which gets available to me as an attribute and I can pass some values to it. And that is exactly what you see here. There's a third type of parameters, which I'm just going to touch and go. I will leave you resources at the end for your own reading, which is cascading parameters. As the name suggests, uh, something cascades all the way. So these are parameters or values which can be uh, used when you have to conquer a multiple, um, go through, through too many layers of nested components. Say some, you have something in your layout component which you want to pass through all the layers, uh, something like a theme value which you want for your application. Um, so in such cases, you can use cascading parameters to achieve the scenario. What you would do is pass a cascading value and the components would consume that as cascading parameters. There's a, there's a little code demo in my solution for this. I will let you read up and have a look at it. Moving on, uh, life cycle of a component. As developers, um, for myself, I would really love to control the behavior and override uh, the output, if I can, of anything. Uh, and of, of course, for that, with components, we have life cycle methods. Uh, there are three or four different lifecycle methods which I can talk you through. The first one is set parameters async. So this is the first lifecycle component, a lifecycle event which runs for the component. And the main job of it is to set the parameters for the component. Let's have a look at the signature for this um, event, which I have got here. Uh, it's an async method which returns a task. Of course, it's an override and it accepts accepts a parameter view object as a, uh, as a parameter to the method. The parameter view object is a collection of um, parameters and values uh, which the component has received. So my shared component, this is a shared component, uh, and I've got three parameters specified as component parameters, first name, last name, and job title. When I call this per, uh, component from my page here, component lifecycle, I am only passing the first name and last name values. So when the control gets to this method, the parameter view object would only have the first name and last name parameters and their values. I haven't supplied anything for the job title parameter, so that we skipped. So when this method runs, what it does is it tries to match up the parameters against the values it has. And when it finds a match, the value is assigned. If there is no incoming value for a component parameter, that parameter is skipped from any assignment of values. Going to this page and looking at the browser console, uh, as you can see, I am trying, write, trying to write something to the browser console. And what I'm doing here is looping through this parameter view, parameter view object and trying to write out what was bound and what is the value. As you can see, when it enters here, the first name is bound and then the last name is bound. The value of the job title parameter is completely skipped. The second method, which runs soon after set parameters async is the on initialized method, which again has an async version. Uh, it runs soon after set parameters async. And if you have any data initialization, like calling out to a database or a third party service to initialize your data, this is where you uh, write the code for that and handle the logic. Uh, in Blazor WebAssembly, it runs only one time. The method runs only once. And in Blazor server apps, because of the way the server app is, where it pre-renders and then connects to the server using a signal R connection, this method is rendered twice. Another important point about this method is that 
if a component is refreshed, say a parent component refreshes a child component, this method is completely skipped upon refreshes. This method gets called only when the component is requested for the first time. The third one is on parameter set. Whenever the parameters change for a component, this method kicks in. It usually kicks in after on initialized, but thereafter it kicks in every time when the parameters change. Um, same like before, if you have a component refresh, if a parent component refreshes a child component, the on initialized method is skipped in that scenario. And in such instances, the on parameter set async method kicks in after the set parameters async method. The last method, which uh, I want to discuss today about the lifecycle is on after render, which again has a async version. This is the last lifecycle method to run, uh, but that doesn't make it any less important because this method runs only when the component has completely rendered. Uh, you might have instances where you want to call JavaScript from your code. Uh, you might want to ref, uh, refer to child components and the elements uh, from a parent component, say, for example. So all those child uh, element references, all the DOM is ready for you to query only at this point. Um, so going back to my sample repo, uh, let me first take you through the um, method signatures for the own initialized and parameter set a sync. The own initialized is pretty much simple. It is it returns a void. You can do what you need to do here. The on parameter set a sync returns a task. Uh, and if I look at the browser, you can see it running one after the other. The on after render async method returns a task and accepts a first render boolean as a parameter. So there might be instances where you want to perform logic only for the say first uh, first re render of a component. So in such instances, you can do this check to see whether it's the first render of a component and then perform logic based on that. So that's about lifecycle methods. Data binding, of course, Blazor is a single page application framework and it supports data binding. Uh, the first type of bit data binding is one-way data binding. So let's talk about that briefly. Uh, one-way data binding is unidirectional flow of updates. Uh, an example would be to read or display something uh, using at the rate syntax. It's classic razor syntax. So if you have a property or a field, at the rate property name or at the rate field name can display the value for you. That is a, a good example of one-way data binding. Sometimes you might have scenarios where I am trying to display something, but that value is updated upon an interaction from the user side. That still is one-way data binding because it's the application that does the update for me. I cannot do anything myself as a user to update that value. So as an example here, I've got this page. I've got a one-way data binding example. I'm trying to display a field or a property which I've specified in my code. It's a field. I'm trying to display the value here. I've got a button and uh, upon click, it does some method. And if you look at the method, I'm trying to increment the value of the current count field. I'll talk about event handling in the next slide. So I'm just leaving it to some method for now. And if I run this demo, upon click me, it updates the value behind the scenes and I can only display that value. I cannot update it myself. That is the most important aspect of one-way data binding. The second one of second type of data binding is the two-way data binding, which is the lifeline of forms in Blazor. Uh, if you are familiar with a JavaScript library like AngularJS or React, more frameworks, uh, you would be very familiar with this concept of two-way data binding because data binding, you can see it happening real time if you want. Uh, and all the magic in data bind, two-way data binding in Blazor happens with the at the rate bind attribute. This attribute is specified on HTML elements, say input type text or input type checkbox. Uh, and the value of the bind attribute binds to a property name or a field name or even a razor expression. Um, the bind attribute is quite smart enough to understand which uh, attribute of the native HTML element should it bind to. So for example, in my demo, 
I have this uh, demo here where I'm binding a first name field in my code to this input type text. So this bind attribute is clever enough to understand that it should bind the first name to the value attribute of the input type text. Uh, by default, two-way data binding happens once the user focuses out of the field. So when I step out of the field, the data should bind. So in, in, in case of an input type text, it happens on own change. But I can always override it, and I can set the data binding to happen upon another event. In that instance, to make that happen, I would use a syntax like this, bind colon event equals on input. So this tells uh, Blazor that, hey Blazor, bind this text box uh, value to the first name input field here, but don't bind it on on change. I want you to bind the data on the on input event. Uh, so if I go and have a look at the demo here, if I type in my name here, nothing happens. Uh, there's one thing I forgot to mention. I'm also trying to display the value here so that you can get to see when it actually binds. So Let's start all over again. I have pressed tab, focused out. That is when the data gets bound for me. But in the second box where I have changed the bind event to on input, upon every input from my keyboard, the data is getting bound and I can see that value changing as well for me. So that's two-way data binding. Let's talk about event handling in Blazor. You've already seen examples of this, but in my demo today, but to just reiterate everything, events can be specified um, as, HTML, as attributes of HTML element of the format on event, where event is the event name. Uh, say, for example, I can specify an at the rate on click as an as a event for, the, for a button, and the value of that would be treated as an event handler. So when I when I execute a click action on the button, the handle on click event would run. Event handlers can return async uh, and, and a task. You can even, uh, even though the event handlers do not expect any arguments, you can pass it an optional event tags like a mouse event tags or a keyboard event tags if you wish to understand more about what caused the event or say which key, key was pressed. Let's have a look at the sample code for this again. One way data binding. I've got this button here and I'm specifying an event here. And as you can see, it's all of the format on click on event. Uh, and I'm specifying a value here called increment count. And this would be treated as an event handler. The event handler is in my C sharp code here. It updates some value for me. And it is the reason why when I click, the value increments for me. So that's event handling for you. Um, I can also show you something about um, mouse event arcs. So if I click this button, it should write into the console which, which mouse button was clicked. So for example, if I click this, as you can see, it's updating a zero. The reason being I am I'm clicking a left button and the value for the left button is zero. And the code for that is here. For the mouse event args, there's a button which on click. And in the event handler, I've got my mouse event args, which updates some value and writes which button it is into the control. I can also pass in a keyboard event args, which outputs the key uh, which I have pressed. If you want to have a look at that, it's, it's labeled incorrectly, by the way. I'm sorry about that. As you can see, it is updating something in the browser console for me. So that's event handling with an optional event tags. The last thing I want uh, to discuss is the accessing the JavaScript runtime. I will very quickly run through this. Um, you can access JavaScript runtime from Blazor apps. So you can call .NET from JavaScript, or you can actually call um, JavaScript from your .NET code. And for that, you are given a nice injectable dependency called IJS runtime from Microsoft. So this is basically an instance of the JavaScript runtime to which you can dispatch your call. Once you have injected this into your code, I can make use of it in my code. 
because it's a JavaScript code, going a few slides back, it needs to be handled in the on render after a sync method, which is exactly what I'm doing here. I've got the JavaScript runtime um, and I've got the invoke void async method here, which uh, accepts an identifier, which is a function identifier. And I'm passing in a series of arguments which are serializable. The function identifier um, is specified in the function is specified in a scripts JS file. And as you can see, it is specified on an alert scope and the alerts is specified on the window global scope. So that's one of the requirements of this method. The function identifier must be relative to the global scope, which is the window. Hence, I've got it as alerts and show alerts dot show alert. It doesn't return a value. And all what I'm doing in my script.js is alerting something that I'm passing to the function. Um, the script.js needs to be referred in the index.html file, which is the root of your Blazor application, because it's from here all the controls go through. And if I have a brief look at the demo here, as you can see, it is getting outputted. Uh, last but least, com components can communicate with each other as well. I've got a little demo here where I can see the parent updating the child. I let you have a look at the code and read through the samples, but I can I can all also update from the child to the parent as well. So that's my resources. I believe the links to which has been shared. Thank you. Excellent presentation, uh, Puranama. That was amazing. Uh, everything was very clear and um, all of the resources noted. So really, really, really great job. Um, I don't, oh, we have one question that I want to mm -hmm. get. Um, and uh, so let's, let's pull it up. Um, so it's by Cosmo and it says, can Blazor handle dynamic routes from CMS? Um, I believe some kind of integration should be possible. This is something that I'm quite interested in myself as well, something that I'm going to look forward to as well. Um, I believe you can do something about it. I haven't tried it myself, but I would be equally interested. So if I if I achieve something with it, definitely I'll let you know. Okay. I haven't attempted it myself, but yes, I am hoping that something should be possible. You can do something clever. Yeah, we can play around with it. Yeah. Um, excellent. Maybe if you do discover a solution, we can we can tweet about it um, and promote Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I'm on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, amazing. Um, I believe. Uh, I don't. Let's see if we can pull this one up. Um, this is by um, Pipe Tabor. Uh, how will Blazor perform with an enterprise app? I have absolutely no doubts about it because Blazor is production ready. And uh, I think uh, Blazor server came out last year with 3.1.NET Core. And even before that, people were really playing around with Blazor and there, there's millions of blog posts around it. So I am pretty sure the performance will be on par with any, any other application that you've got out there. And with .NET Standard coming on, .NET 5 coming on board, um, everything is going towards a more uniform platform, which means you can you can pull in code from elsewhere, use it, um, basically. And you, 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 if you have written something for Blazor, you can equally use it elsewhere as well. So I think there's a huge potential for Blazor, especially with applications. That is where I see Blazor being used, and I think it'll perform really well. Excellent. Well, thank you so much uh, for your time and your feedback. Uh, we really appreciate it. Excellent session. This was recorded. So if you are unavailable to catch the whole session, you can rewind and catch it on the stream. Uh, thank you so much, Purnama, for joining us today. We really appreciate it.